Both barrels. Good morning. Good to see all of you. And by the way, I wanted to say we are neither plateaued nor declining. Amen. We're on the way upward and onward. Well, that was lousy. Come on. We thank the Lord for doing what He's doing and asking Him to continue to do. I'd like for you to go, if you would, to Genesis chapter 12, continuing on with the idea of the three chairs. Um, just to recap for just a moment. Wow, I've got less time today than I had the other day. We've done a lot this morning. I'll have to hurry. Pray for me. I don't cough a lot. That'll take more time. Um, yeah, thank you. This, this third, would you please stop coughing? You'll get me to coughing that way if you, if you cough. <laughs> Uh, no, he's all right when he's asleep. Um, conflict. The third chair is conflict. Now, when I first started these messages, the person sitting in this chair was a non-believer, an individual who had never been saved and probably thought, that he had it <coughs> all figured out. This individual had um, had it figured out because he may have watched the this person most of his life. In fact, I'm going to get into that as the Lord willing here in a little while. Because today, the person sitting in this chair <coughs> is an individual who um, knows God, knows about God, has heard about God, but does not know Him personally. There are a lot of people in the world today, if you ask, and I know we're finding more and more people that don't believe in God or say they don't believe in God but uh, and say that they're atheists or agnostic or whatever, but atheists don't believe in any God, but, but they sure use his name an awful lot not to believe in him. Yeah, they do. Uh, but... This person may have formed a, an opinion about God that he wasn't worth serving. Uh, society today would tell us that we don't need God any longer, that God's not an important part of our life any longer. And so this person today is going to represent Jacob in the Bible. And all of you, most of you know who Jacob is, and we'll describe more about Jacob a little bit later on. And so today, as we look at this chair of conflict, we're going to see an individual who, who knows God or knows about God, has heard about God, has seen God work, but yet has made a decision that it's all about me not about God, but it's about me. And we live in a generation today of me. In fact, in the seventh church in the book of Revelation, the Laodicean church, if you look up the name of Laodicea, and uh, it has some different meanings, but the meaning when I was in Bible college that they taught us was rights of the people. 
In fact, what it meant was, I have my rights. And I have a right not to have to hear you or see you or listen to you. I have my right not to have to drive down the street and see a nativity over on a church lawn or, or a courthouse lawn, or I have my right to not have to drive down the street and see the Ten Commandments up somewhere. I have my rights, the rights of the people. It's all about me. I want you to satisfy me. I want to be satisfied. When I come to church, I want you to bless me. Go ahead, preacher. I dare you. Try. There's been better preachers than you've tried, and they've not done it yet either. Go ahead, because it's all about me. The person sitting in this chair is in tremendous conflict because they've made a decision that, yeah, there might be a God, but I don't need him in my life. Therefore, they conduct themselves in ways that where they might be able to straddle the fence in, in such a way uh, or to be able to say with one thing that I don't believe in him, but then the next moment cry out to him or, or in a time of need try and respond to him in some way to where he would respond to them. And so they're constantly in conflict. And so the person sitting in the middle chair today as far as compromise goes, is that we find this individual is, if you remember those that were here and those that have looked at the videos or whatever, that I made a statement that they have uh, God on the tip of their tongue, but self on the throne of their heart. They're in a relationship of me, then God. This person is all about me, but this person is me, then God, that I'm first, and then God comes second. I've compromised my life to the point to where this person might even be my child, and that he's seen how hypocritical I am, and that he wants nothing to do with God because he sees that God's not real important in my life. And I'm not trying to fuss at anybody, but I'm, I'm just telling you about what's going on now, the generational slide that we saw in Joshua's life with Joshua, the elders, and then the grandchildren, we're seeing today again in Abraham's life to where Isaac is now sitting here in this chair of compromise. Because Isaac compromised his life over and over and over and over again. And this person has tremendous influence on those that are watching him or her. May be the leader of the family. May be an individual who, who even borders on the idea that, well, I know there's something out there, and I know there's somebody out there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe in God just to be saved and they're compromising their life and saying also that God's not the that you know that Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven there's other ways of getting there he's not the only way so he compromises his life and so we're going to put Isaac here in this chair today and then of course Abraham is sitting in this chair of commitment that he has committed himself to God to follow God, to do what God wants him to do. And we're going to go to Scripture here in a moment, but we find that the person that's sitting here in, in the chair of commitment, this is not an easy chair to sit in. This is not a fun chair to sit in a lot of times because it's in this chair that you'll have to make decisions that people won't like. It's in this chair that you'll have to do things that will even cross your own life and that may even cost you yourself some things that in your life or your, it might even cost your family something and that the cost might be too great for you. I heard about a preacher the other day that, that uh, went on the mission field and, 
and lost his support. And when they got back, that it divided their family. Him, him and his wife divorced. It was so traumatic on them and that he quit the ministry altogether. The cost was too great. And so sitting here in this chair, you've got to be careful about the decisions that you make because it may cost you more than you want to pay. But you're committed. Paul would say, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You see, the person that's sitting in the chair of commitment, though I live or die, I'm going to live for God or die for him, one or the other. And so as we look at Abraham's life and the things that have been going on there in his life, look at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and shalt, thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That What a, what a tremendous statement. Now, Abraham or Abram at the time was not, as far as we know, a follower of God. He was living in a pagan land. He was living among pagan gods. He was living among pagan people. And then all of a sudden God comes to him and says, I want you out of here. I want you to take what's yours. I want you to go. And I want you to go into a land that I'm going to show you you don't know where it's at right now. You don't know how far it is from you right now. You don't know where we're going. You don't know the obstacles that will be on the way. You don't know anything about the trip, but I'm going to take you there. Now, come on, let's go. I don't know about you all, but I said, Lord, can we not talk about this a little bit? Um, should I take my gun with me? Uh, should... Can I take some other people with me? Could, you know, where are we going? How, what about my GPS? Can I take it? That way, you know, we won't get lost or what, where are we going, Lord? Uh, I'm not telling you, you'll know when we get there. Abram had to be committed it must have been so bad at home that he was tickled to go anywhere besides staying there at home. But somewhere along the line, God got to his heart, brought him out of there, and he saw some things. Look at chapter 35, verses 1 through 4, if you would, in Genesis. And I'm going to read that, and then we're going to move on as quickly as possible. 35 one through four, and God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. Now pay attention to this, because God was with him one time uh, when he fled from Esau his brother. God appeared to him. Uh, in fact, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him at one point, broke his leg, touched him on the thigh, broke his leg, and he walked with a limp the rest of his life. He remembered that meeting. But he had put away all of the things concerning God, and all of his people had picked up false gods and picked up the gods of the land we put him in this chair of conflict. Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. Change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was 
and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. The first chair represents Abraham. The second chair represents Isaac. And for time's sake, I'm not going to get into a whole lot this morning. But then the third chair represents uh, Jacob, as we just saw. The relationship to God was something that was tremendous. In fact, uh, uh, they, it, it, your relationship to God determines a lot of things in your life. Let me ask you, how do you make decisions? Do you, do you make them real quickly without much consideration or without much prayer or without much uh, thought? Uh, is the decision difficult to you or do you pray about it? Do you ask for help? Do you consider the advice of friends first of all? or only, or do you ask God about it and talk to God about it and base your decisions based upon what God might speak to your heart about? And you might say, preacher, I don't know what you're talking about. That's the problem today. If we want to buy that new Cadillac, well, I use a Cadillac. Let's, let's use something else. I don't know. Volkswagen. If we want to buy a new car, a lot of times we'll 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 spend we'll spend a little time prayer about Lord. You know I need that car. You know, Lord, I need that new car. I, I'm getting tired of smelling that old thing that I get in every now and then, and and you know it's the motor's knocking, and there's and and you'll find more wrong with that old car than what there really is wrong with it. Just to convince yourself that you need a new car. Now, if you got the money, go buy you a new car. I'm not against buying. In fact, if anybody wants to buy me a new car, go right ahead. That right, baby? Yeah. Uh, but but we'll, we'll convince ourselves about things that we want more than anything else. And all along, we might have a friend tell us, don't do it, don't do it. Those cars aren't worth anything. They're lemons. They, they'll break down on you. The parts are expensive. Don't buy that car. But I'll tell you what, when I bought that red Dodge Dually four-wheel drive pickup truck in 2001, God was in it. I'll let you know that. He wasn't in the payments, but he was in the decision to buy it. But how do we make our decisions? What, how do we consider this? Do we read God's Word? Do we meditate upon His Word and upon His ideas? Do we ask God, God, what should we do with this extra money we got that people with first-hand faith honor God's Word? And so when, when we look at the relationship to God, we find that the first chair has a relationship of God than me. God, it's more important to me what you think rather than what I think. It's more important to me what you want out of my life than what I want out of my life. I put you first, and I tell people this all the time. Jenny knows this about me. I know this about Jenny. As far as God's concern, he's number one in my life. She's number two. But as far as people, he's number one in my life. And don't ever say nothing bad about her, because if you want to make me mad, that makes me mad. But I know that in Jenny's life, God is number one. I don't mind taking a back seat to God in her relationship because I know if she's putting God first, I'm going to enjoy my happy wife, happy life. You know that, guys, help me out here, amen? Uh, and so, and I know that if she's happy, 
in the Lord, I'm going to be a happy camper as well. And if I'm putting God first in my life, then she has the confidence in me to know that I'm trying my best to follow God. And so the person that's sitting in the chair of commitment is an individual who is saying, I'm not going to go anywhere without God leading me. I'm not going to do anything without God making the decision for my life. I'm not going to uh, think about anything without God directing my thoughts. I think about Moses when he was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and they were having some problems and they were having some difficulty and there was sin in the camp and so uh, they God brought judgment upon them in Exodus chapter 32 and 33. 33 is the majority of it. But there in chapter 33 that Moses said, if your presence does not go before us, don't send us. Glory to God. The person that's sitting in the first chair saying, God, I don't want to go anywhere without your presence going before me. Hallelujah to God. Somebody ought to wave a hanky there. No, I'm going to get a box of them and pass them out on the back as people come in. That When we got something to get excited about. But yet, we ought to determine in our lives, we're not going to make a decision without God in it, first of all. We're not going to go anywhere without God in it, first of all. We're not going to do anything without God in it, first of all. And I'm not talking about just in our personal lives. I'm talking about it in our churches today. And that is one reason why many churches are closing down because they've left God on the outside and they're trying to do it themselves and do it on their own. And it isn't going to work. In fact, in the Laodicean church, where is Jesus? At the door knocking, wanting in. That's not a salvation message. That's not Jesus saying, you that are unsaved, I'm knocking on your heart's door. If you'll let me in, I'll come in and save you. That's not what that's talking about. That's the church. And Jesus is on the outside of the church knocking on the door and saying, church, if you'll just let me in, I'll come in and sup with you. And you can sup with me. Glory that we need to allow him to be in our churches. That's pitiful. He ought to already be in our churches. But a lot of people today are kicking him out. A lot of churches today are saying, we don't need God any longer. I was at a church one time, I'm not going to tell you which one it was, but I had one of the deacons tell me, we don't need God's word any longer. We've got our bylaws and articles of faith. I wanted to smack him. I thought, God, why aren't you striking him dead? Why aren't you knocking him down? Just a little sin. That's all I'm asking. Just a little bolt of lightning. Because anybody that would say they don't need God's word any longer, where do you think they're sitting? Mm, anytime the articles of faith replace the word of God, we're in trouble. We're in deep trouble. Mm, I didn't know I was going to preach like this. First chair has a relationship of God, me. He knows God. He has seen his power. He loves and serves God. He receives God's blessings and his, and his glory. Uh, the person that's sitting in that first chair uh, has seen that kind of situation and God has put before them an open door and says, I'll bless your life. I'll take care of you. I'll do for you what you need done even though you don't know you need it done. And there we find Abraham. And Abraham wasn't perfect. You all know that. You all know when Abraham, Abram and Sarai, they got up there in the kingdom and, then, and he told Sarai, he said, now tell him you're my son. Because if he thinks you're my wife, he'll kill me. The king. So the king took Sarai in to lay with her and God stopped him and said, hey, what you're about to do is wrong. She's a married woman. And he goes back out to Abram and says, what in the world have you done? Well, 
Abram didn't completely lie to him. You know why? Because Sarah was his half-sister. He just told a little white one. I mean, it wasn't a big one. It was just a little one because Sarah was his half-sister. So he didn't completely lie. But at that point, he wasn't sitting here, was he? He was back over here. He was scared for his own life. But it wasn't long he moved back over into the chair of commitment and went on and kept going on and on and on and on. But yet we find that he knew God. That was a, <coughs> a lesson in his life. And I could read other verses and talk about when he took Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him and God stopped him and all of that, that he was firmly planted in the chair of commitment. I'm going to do what God... <coughs> Ask me to do no matter what because God will make a way. If God wants me to take on hell with a water pistol, I'm going to fill it up and go, I'm going to get one of them beggings to go with it. Because if God wants me to go there, he'll make a way out of there. I've told God before I'd go there and preach if he wouldn't make me stay. And I want to tell you something. There'd been a time or two I thought I was there. I told him, can you remember when you first got saved? I don't know if y'all did this or not, but I was just overwhelmed. I couldn't understand it as a young boy. Well, I'd have gone anywhere and done anything, and I'd have talked to anybody. Big or little alike. I wasn't afraid of nobody. I'd tell them about Jesus. I told adults about him. I told the neighbors. I told drunks about him. I told dogs about him and cats about him and everybody else about him. I wasn't afraid to tell anybody about him, but... That soon passed. That went by the wayside after a while. But the person sitting in the first chair has a relationship of God and then me. The second chair has a relationship of me and then God. This person sitting here in this chair had watched this person. He or she had seen what God did for him or her. He knew that God was capable of doing this, but would he really do it for me? Would he really answer my prayer? You see, this person had never experienced the things that this person had experienced. Remember, was it last week I said we quit telling the stories? We, we stopped telling the stories, but and the stories kind of got old to the person sitting here and said, yeah, yeah, I've heard that all my life. The Lord's coming. Yeah, I've heard that all my life. Jesus is coming back. He's going to rapture the church out of here. Yeah, I've heard that all my life. Jesus can set you free from all kinds of things. Yeah, I've heard that before. Why am I struggling with it? By the clock up on the wall, it's only 11 o'clock. church I pastored there was a young man uh, got saved and um, he was bad to drink and drugs and stuff and, and when he got saved just like that they were gone he dropped it told me he never desired it never had a Never wanted another one. God took it away from him just like that. And there was another man in the church that was an alcoholic. And he would do real well for six or eight months. And then he would 
go get drunk. I mean, just knocked down drunk. A few weeks later, he would come back to church crying, and he'd talk to me and say, Preacher, why? I don't want to do this. Why? Why can't I be set free from this? And he'd say, Glenn, when he got saved, he didn't desire another drink. He didn't touch his stuff after he got saved. Why am I struggling with it? And in a roundabout way, I told him, I said, because you have a relationship with God to where it's more important about you than it is God. When he got saved, his relationship with God was all about God. Would you agree? When you first get saved, then nothing else matters. It's all about God. I said, but you've been saved for a long time. And I'll guarantee you when you first got saved, God did the same thing for you. But you start hanging around your old friends. You start going around the old places. Your brother started calling you and say, hey, Jim, come go with us. And you go. Let me tell you something. If your friends are causing you to sin, I'd find new friends. I'd find new ones. But Jim, that's why he would go fall off the wagon. Because his brother would call him and say, Hey, Jim, it won't hurt. Come go with us. We're going to go shoot pool or we're going to go do this or that. And they'd go to the bar and he'd get drunk and he'd be drunk for a while. And he struggled with it. Struggled with it to the point to where he committed suicide in their outdoor carport. A week before he did that, he said, and we were living in Tennessee and just getting ready to move back to West Virginia. And he said, um, Joe, I can't wait for you to get home. I need to talk to you. And I said, hang in there, Jim, because we're coming home. And then one morning, his brother-in-law called me and told me, you see, he just couldn't deal with it. Couldn't, couldn't deal with it any longer. You see, the person sitting here has a relationship of me, then God. As long as my needs are being met, then I'll allow God in my life. And that's a dangerous place to be. And the person sitting here is all about me. We are in an entitlement generation. It's all about me. Feed me. Give me. Notice me. Jacob was all about me. He wanted to make sure he got the birthright, so he tricked his daddy into giving it to him. And he was in conflict the rest of his life. He was in conflict before that, but for the rest of his life, he was in conflict. Went into Egypt when he shouldn't have been in Egypt. Because God said, I'll take care of you and I'll take care of your children because of your father, Abraham. Because remember, the covenant was with Abraham, not with Jacob. The covenant was with Abraham, not Isaac. The covenant was with Abraham. And he said, because of Abraham, I'll bless your life. Because of Abraham, I'll take care of you. And it was conflict all of his life because he had the me attitude. And many times we get in that situation because the person that has a me attitude will come to church out of necessity or feeling responsible in coming. And they won't get much out of church because they've there's nothing there. Uh, 
I don't know about y'all, but I feel something every time I come to church. I do, and I need to. I need to be blessed every time I come to church because I don't know about y'all, but I run into a bunch of filth out there during the week. I run into a mess out there during the week. I run into nasty stuff out there during the week, and I need to be blessed when I come to church. I need to feel His presence when I come to church. I need to, I need to feel His power when I come to church because it gives me strength to face what I have to face on a daily basis. The person, it's all about me. I tell you, I pray for Norman all the time. I pray for all of you, but I pray for Norman and his job all the time. I can't imagine what he faces day in and day out up at the prison. What he sees and faces on a regular basis more than what any of us would ever face. I, I can't imagine. But I got to hurry. I'm in overtime. The first chair makes decisions based upon the Word of God. Abraham made his decisions based upon God's Word. What God told him, God's promises for him, Abraham made his decisions based upon the Word of God. Second chair people make their decisions based upon other saints or other people that will look at them and say, I'm just as good as they are. Or I go to church just as much as they do. Or I do just as much as they do. And so we make our decisions and we, we gauge our spirituality on looking at each other. That's wrong. That's wrong because, in fact, I know that you're supposed to be able to look at me as a preacher and see me as an example, and I live that every day, and I do my best every day to, to be that example, but don't, don't put too much pressure on me because I'm only human. Don't gauge your spirituality by me. Gauge it by God and God's Word. Look in His mirror. Look in His Word. Look at Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to be like Joe Hutchinson. We're supposed to be like Jesus. But the person sitting in this chair, I won't be like Robert. And I'm just kidding because I don't. But And he could say the same thing about me. But we might say, oh, Will Gates... I'll pick out the most spiritual person in our church, and that's who I want to be like. Well, stop it. Because you don't know what they're like at home. You don't know what they're like at, out on the job somewhere. You don't know what they're like out in public. And I've been sneaking around a little too, I want you to know, at the grocery stores and listening across the aisle. in the ice cream section. This person is doing something awful by trying to gauge their spiritual life based on other people in the church. While this person, this person gauges their life and conducts themselves based on society. Well, right now, society says we don't need God. Right now, society says we, you know, here back a few years ago, God was dead. Well, I knew he wasn't, didn't you all? Because uh, he was still alive in my life. But God was dead, and now they couldn't kill him, so now they said we just don't need him. So the person in conflict He's just saying, we don't need God any longer. So I'm going to quit. But let me tell you something. Let me just close with this. There's coming a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to his precious name.
and everyone will stand before the throne of God and give an account. Even the naysayers who say, we don't need God any longer. But I I'm glad that I'm not going to be in that number because I'm already going to have all my praise and over with. Well, it won't really be over with. It'll just continue throughout eternity. But see, I'm going to go up in the rapture or, or either go up in the resurrection and, and I'm going to have a time. While they're having tribulation down here on the earth, I'm going to be having a time. I'm going to be running and jumping, climbing over the walls of the new city, Jerusalem. I'm going to be swinging on the gates of pearl. I want to tell you, I'm going to be like a five-year-old kid to turn wild. You know, I'm just going to have, I have a time when I get to heaven and go, we're going to go through the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're going to be crowning Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And we're going to get them ready for all the other people to come see him. We're going to be standing in the background saying, go get him, Jesus. Go get him. Bow before him. Do you said all this? Can I tell you a story before I quit? Can I tell you a story? I heard a missionary several years ago. He was in the Philippines. And uh, they and I was preaching a revival. And they this missionary came to the revival service. And they asked him to give a testimony because of what had just happened the, a couple of weeks before in the Philippines. And so he got up and he was talking about this little village to where the missionaries were at. And they were working with this little village. And one day that while the men were off working in the jungles of Philippines, that the communists came and as they were doing Bible study and, and stuff with the women and the children and the young, uh, young men that were still there, <coughs> that the communists surrounded their little hut. And he said it was a little ba bamboo hut that didn't go all the way to the ground. The bamboo didn't. And it didn't go all the way to the roof. And there was a grass roof on it. And they were inside having Bible study and praying. And the communists surrounded that hut. And, and uh, they said, where is your God now? And they uh, began to shoot into that little hut and kill all of them except one little girl. And that one little girl told them what had happened after they all came back and the, and the authorities got there. And that missionary said, oh, I want to tell you something. He said, I believe that one of these days there's going to be a, a girl in heaven, and she's going to be at the great white throne judgment, and there's going to be a bunch of communist guerrilla come up there and give an account and give an answer for what they've done. And, and they're going to stand before God. And that little Filipino girl is going to say, Hey, hey, listen to me. You asked me one time, where was my God? There he is sitting on the throne. Glory to his name. He's never left the throne. No matter what people may say today, he's still on the throne of God. He's still there. And Jesus is at his right hand. Glory to his name. I'm glad I know him. I'm glad he's mine and I'm his. And I'm glad he knows my name. And one of these days he's going to call it and I'm going to go be with him. Glory to God. I'm about to get excited. It's only 15 after 11 by that clock. Which chair are you in today? Abraham had the first chair. Jacob had the second. Or excuse me, Isaac had the second. And Jacob was sitting in the third. You know where you're at. You know which chair you're in. You know which chair you've been in. You know which chair you move from the most. And sometimes we move a lot from the second chair to the first chair. Maybe during movements of spiritual high, during revival, or during what we saw last Sunday night. Where are you? What chair are you sitting in? Are you in a life of conflict? 
on the bubble? Are you in a life of compromise? It's a dangerous place to be because your children see that. Do you need to move to a place of commitment? Or are you there today and saying, I'm committed? I'm going to follow Jesus no matter where He leads me. I'm committed to do what He asks me to do. I'm committed to live for Him no matter what. Would you stand with me, please? His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Do you need to come? You say, preacher, I don't like the chair I'm sitting in. I don't like it. I want to do something about it. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. I do believe in God. I, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. I know, I believe what he did for me on the cross of Calvary, but I've never, never asked the Lord to save me. Never ask Him to come into my heart. That might be you this morning. You, you're sitting in a chair of conflict. The battle's raging in your life and in your heart. And you'll say, Preacher, please pray for me. I want to be saved. Would you just slip up your hand, take it right back down. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I promise you. Thank you, honey. Anybody else? Slip up your hand, take it right back down. Thank you. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to go to heaven. It's a wonderful place. I want to go to heaven. Please pray for me. Is there anybody else? Slip up your hand. Take it right back down. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I promise you. I want to pray for you. Thank you. This church wants to pray for you. I appreciate those hands that went up this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those. You say, preacher, I'm sitting in a chair of compromise. I have compromised my Christian life. Uh, I believe in God. I've asked Jesus to save me before, but I know that I'm not living where I ought to be living. I know that I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. Which chair are you? Where are you? Are you in this place of compromise today? You'll say, preacher, that's me. Please pray for me that I'll move up. I'll confess my sin. I know that he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Would you pray for me? Would you slip up your hand, take it right back down? No, no coming to you. Thank you. Anybody else? Up and down. Come on. Your children. Thank you. Your children, your family might they'd be in the balances here. They're, they're, what you do will determine what happens in their life many, many times. Anybody else slip up, right, come right back down. Please pray for me. Father, as I kneel here in front of this chair of compromise, I'm praying for these folks, Lord. First of all, for these that are sitting in the chair of conflict, unsaved, no hope right now. Father, have never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. God, may they have seen the love of God and the love of Christ today. May they have seen just how much Jesus loves them and that he would die upon the cross of Calvary for their sin. And God, your word tells us, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God, we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Father, this day, right now in this hour, may someone come to know you in pardon and forgiveness of sin. God, may they be changed for eternity right now. Father, I pray for them. I pray for these, Lord, that lifted their hand that are sitting in the chair of compromise. And God, that they'll move. They'll come forward. Move out of this place. It's a dangerous place to be. 
to move out of this seat, moving to the chair of commitment that as far as today's concerned, this moment right now in my life, I'm committing my life to Christ, presenting my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service today. I'm going to take care of it today. Father, I pray for them. That during this invitation time, Lord, that the Holy Spirit of God would go from their heart to heart, from place to place, from seat to seat. Move them for your glory and for their sake, I pray in Jesus' name and amen. Would you come as we sing?